to be here with you today. It has been a while since I have been in this house. And I am, I am rejoicing that I'm here, but I'm sad that it's been a while. Um, but as you know, we've had this little thing over the last couple of years yes, where we haven't gone much of anywhere right. except our homes. We learned how to live in a pair of pajamas all week long. <laughs> Some of us may have already known how to do that, but we learned how to do it week after week after week after week. It is such a blessing to be here, and I do honor your pastor this morning. She is a friend, and um, we have been in some interesting situations. Uh, I won't go into them, but I will tell you about us on uh, stage one time in England how much fun we had with her after. <laughs> Should I tell that whole story? She had, she had a new, brand new outfit. It was double buttons all the way down. It was this gold, beautiful gold buttoned, beautiful, nicely fitting. It was gorgeous. We're in England. Uh, she ministered the morning session. It was an amazing session. Uh, have a lot of Jamaicans there. Uh, actually, a mixture of many nations in that conference when we went. And we went to lunch. And as we we're going through the line, uh, Rhonda started telling me this story. She said, you know, there was a new uh, cleaners in town, and I had heard wonderful things about them, and I took my, my brand new jacket to them for them to clean. And can I tell you, she, she pushed, you know, she looked, these, these buttons were gold, and now they bleached them out, and they are all silver. <laughs> and she was so aggravated, and I looked at her jacket, and, and I just reached down to one of the buttons and took off the aluminum foil. <laughs> that they had coated all of those gold buttons with. She, believe it or not, for a moment, she was speechless. Believe it or not, for a moment, she was speechless. Right there in the cafeteria, we, we cracked up. How fun it is. And uh, I, I honor your pastor today. This is also the first time since I've been here, since Hank's graduation. And uh, we have grieved with you. As we have celebrated him. Yes. Home. Yes. Home at last. Yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And um, so appreciate uh, your pastor and their, and their daughters. Yes. Oh, my goodness. Courtney, I'll never forget sending you postcards from all over the world. And the one from Australia was the one that made you hit the heavens. <laughs> and uh, what you shared with me about that, I still continue to pray about. Open the door, Lord. In your timing. Amen. He's faithful, isn't he? Yes, he is. Just before I go into the word this morning, I wanted to just give you a little bit of an update yes. on our perspective of Ukraine. Yes. I know that you're seeing a lot of things in the news and you're seeing a lot of hearing a lot of stories. And we have had the opportunity every week to Zoom with all of our pastors. So far, Internet is still working. Uh, even when the even when the electricity is out, I see these precious pastors going out to their cars and plugging their phones into the, the um, and, and of course last week we heard from about four of our pastors that fuel is completely gone now. And so they're, they're on their bicycles delivering food, del delivering diapers, delivering uh, baby food, everything that their people need. Every one of our pastors made the decision to first of all get their families to safety they took them to the border, and most of our pastoral families are in Czech Republic. We have a, a really strong work there, and um, the government has been incredibly uh, a, a great blessing to them. They gave them so much per head. They gave them phones that worked. They put them on a list to um, find work, even if it's temporary. They've given every family a flat that they can live in, a small flat. It's been amazing what God has done, what God has done. And then the pastors went back to serve where they have been assigned. And they have not left. Uh, only one pastor had to flee uh, about two weeks ago. I think she went into Switzerland. But the rest of the pastors have stayed in place. It has been amazing to see uh, the victory. There's still one church uh, right so close to where the occupation is, every morning they have prayer meeting. They have it early in the morning, about 6 or 7 o'clock. He said, 
every morning more and more people are coming and more and more people are getting saved. They're finding the Lord as Savior. You know, crisis does a lot of things, doesn't it? And they, they give food. They give out food on Saturdays, but these people aren't coming for food. They're coming to know the Lord because for them, many of them, this is the end of their world. And they're looking for something stronger, um, something that they can lean into and stand upon. And that's the promises of the Lord. To this day, none of our churches have been destroyed. That seems impossible to me. Hallelujah. To this day, none of our people have been killed. That seems impossible to me, even though many of them are on the front line. Um, we continue to be able to send money in to both Ukraine and into um, Czech, uh, not Czech, yeah, Czech Republic, to where uh, the money is going directly to the needs. There are still some big box stores that have supplies, and they're able to go um, now on their bicycles and pick up what they can can get. It's just amazing. And then this last week, I guess it was four of our pastors told us that the mains of their city have been, the water mains have been destroyed. And so they're out of water. And I keep thinking what I wouldn't do if this was my children and my grandchildren, what I wouldn't do to get water there. Uh, and I'm just so thankful that the Lord has continued to supply according to the need. Uh, I'll give you this one testimony. It's pretty amazing to me. Um, Pastor Sergey, and I won't tell you where he is because you never know how this stuff gets from, this, from, from our little communities into the ears and the hands of other people. But he said they, were, they had been in a tunnel. Uh, several hundred of them had been in a tunnel in their city. And um, many had brought tents and some of them had brought cots and they had set up little family units in this tunnel. And he said one morning when they woke up, the, the bombardment was terrible. It was so loud and awful and people were crying and there was terror and it was dark in the tunnel. And he said, he said, I too experienced the same kind of terror that you do because it kept getting closer and closer to where we were. And he said, suddenly the Holy Spirit fell on me and he said, I began to sing. And as he's, as he's telling this testimony, I hear his booming baritone voice as he's even telling this testimony. He said, I just began to sing. He said, the Holy Spirit fell on me, and I began to sing, and it was praises to the Lord. And he said, the, the more louder, the louder the bombardment came, the louder I sang. He said, I, my eyes were closed, and I just kept singing. And he said, I could hear people coming from both ends of the tunnel coming toward me. And he said, as the bombardment began to lighten, and then finally it stopped, he said, I stopped singing and I looked around and he said, everybody had come from both ends of that tunnel and they were all crowded around me holding on to each other as they were praising God in the midst of the attack. And at the end, he said, so many came and said, thank you so much for reminding us whose hand we're in. Thank you so much for reminding us that we're not here alone. And at the very end, this family came, and they had a, a big old honking gun. I don't, I don't know what it's called, but it was a big one. And they said, you know, when we came down to the tunnel, we brought this with us so that we would, we would be protected and we would have safety from the enemy. And we've remembered that our safety and our protection is not in this. It is in the one to whom you sing. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God is faithful. He's so faithful. And so I love the psalmist when he says, pray for trust among our people. He says, the, your hope, put your hope in the Lord, for with the Lord is unfailing love and with him is full redemption. And so as you pray for the folks of Ukraine, for this nation that is being uh, pulled, well, this nation that is being attacked, we'll say it that way. We don't know what tomorrow will bring many conjecture that Putin will declare war tomorrow on Ukraine. We have no idea, but we know that we have a tremendous opportunity to minister to those who are in crisis today and a wonderful opportunity to impact the kingdom of God in Ukraine, to express his love for the people of Ukraine. We know that it's going to be a long process, but we also know who is in control. So we will continue to pray for them. Father, 
in these moments help. Let us flow in the rhythm of the Holy Spirit. Be in the midst of us. Use your word. Allow your word to come alive and activate us to life and life in full. Let your anointing be rich in and through me and in, in and through your people as you accomplish your purpose for this moment in eternal history. In the name of Jesus, we bless you. Amen. Amen. Through the past few weeks and months, I've been reminded, I'll stay with my notes pretty quick because if I don't, we'll be here all day. You'll just join us at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. <laughs> yes, indeed. I've been reminded that God often uses a season of crisis as a catalyst that awakens us to the presence and the power of God. That which moves us to respond to the possibilities of his work and his ministry. He often uses crisis to reveal the supply of his best blessings and his best investment in each of us. Many of us have had the opportunity to be part of the Lord's compassion, kindness, service, and action in these particular days of crisis. While it's difficult to recognize the blessings in the middle of the crisis, we have almost immediately become witnesses of the blessings and best giftings of leadership, ministry, and love, all attributes that Christ lived before us and demonstrated in his earthly ministry. It is also difficult for us to recognize the blessing of crisis when our attention is focused on the crisis itself. When COVID first started happening and we were all concentrating and focusing on how you got it, how long it lasted, what it might do, all of these terror things about it. It's difficult to recognize God's blessings when we're focused on the crisis rather than focused on the one, hallelujah, the one who, who is constant even in the midst of our crisis. Amen. He disrupts our busyness. He disrupts our projects. He changes things to save us from what we do not see. We must be careful to not be deceived. In the boat, the disciples said to Jesus, don't you care that we are perishing? We're dying here. Don't you even care? Of course he cared. He wanted them to see him as the peace. Not just a peace, the peace in the midst of the storm. Sometimes when I wake up in the middle of the night and I'm terrorized and I can't get back to sleep and I keep reminding the Lord how I need to be rested when I get up out of bed in the morning and I watch the hours click by and I say, well, Lord, if you'll let me go to sleep now, I have four hours. And if you'll let me go to sleep now, there's three and a half, Lord. And you know how we do. And, and sometimes I think the Lord is saying to me, Kathy, I am your rest. If you'll just rest in me. <coughs> it's comforting to remember that the events of this universe are ordered by a compassionate, gracious, long-suffering, faithful God. Sometimes I say to the Lord, I'm really being patient with you here. I love that scripture that says, no, the Lord is being patient with you. When tragedy comes, when crisis rises, we can trust completely for the hour of God's saving grace. I have a friend that often says this. You may also say this, but I've heard another woman say this. When God's got you in the fire, his eye is on the clock. He's not going to leave you in there any longer than you need to be left in there to accomplish his purpose in you. I love that. Hallelujah. He is faithful. And this is the broadest revelation of his sovereign rule in our lives. Understanding his sovereignty is necessary to trusting divine providence. Everything is ordered by God without any dependence on what we think he should do. Right? I remember a season in my life 
It was in the early 80s, and I thought about not saying that because that seems like a century ago. <laughs> John and I were traveling in evangelism, and, and in 85, we had gone to Bakersfield to pastor. We were there for eight years. And as we were traveling and ministering, we were, we were both so young. Uh, I was not young in my walk with the Lord because I found the Lord at eight years old. I was baptized very young with the Holy Spirit. So I had known him for years and years and years. But as we were traveling, we came across people who had had a supernatural visitation of the Lord. And they would talk about how an angel appeared in their living room. And it was more than one person. You know, everywhere we went, we'd hear, man, God is sending out the angels from heaven. And so I got on this kick that I wanted to see an angel. I mean... You can do it for Mary. You can do it for me. You can do it for Joseph. You can do it for me. You can do it for whoever is seeing an angel now. You can let me see an angel. And I prayed and prayed. And as I prayed, John just shook his head at me like, you know, if you need to see an angel, you'll see an angel. But come on, Kathy. I continued my prayer, not in front of him. Lord, I'd love to see an angel. Won't you send an angel to speak to us? Well, we were pastoring in California and we had been there for a little while, and one night in the middle of the, I don't know why the Lord decides he's going to talk to me in the middle of the night. I mean, morning is good, afternoon better, you know. But in the middle of the night, the Lord woke me, he shook me and woke me up, and he said, okay, Kathy, there's an angel in the room. Open your eyes, and you can see it. And terror covered me and I started saying I don't need to see an angel I don't need to see an angel I don't Lord just knowing you're in the room I don't need to see an angel I, I would not open my eyes I did not open my eyes the next morning I said to John there was an angel in the room here last night he said you finally got to see your I said no I didn't open my eyes he said, he said what I said it was terrifying you don't understand he said I cannot believe that you did not open your eyes I said, well, you know, what can I say? <laughs> it was a couple of weeks later. We were watching the news, the 11 o'clock news, and, and um, it was during that time that the Hillside Strangler, maybe you heard about him here in Tennessee, was ravaging California. His name was Richard Ramirez. He was breaking into people's homes. He was absolutely influenced by demons. The things that he did to people and even to their bodies after they were dead. It was, it was horrible, and I, I won't give glory to the Lord, but we're sitting, I mean, to the enemy. We're sitting there watching the news, and suddenly this is what the anchor says. Richard Ramirez has been seen in Bakersfield. I, I immediately said, well, if he's been seen, why didn't they pick him up? Why isn't he in prison? What do you mean he's been seen in Bakersfield? Why didn't somebody do something? And suddenly everything inside of me is shaking. Now, I know you probably are a lot calmer than this, but I, I'm terrified. John goes, gets start getting ready for bed, and I'm, I'm, I'm closing and locking every window of my house. We had sliding glass doors, and that's how he was gaining access to many homes. I put the stick in, in the door so that there was no getting through. I'm, I get to the, the bathroom, and I brush my teeth and wash my face, and John is one of these men. I, I knew this early once we had married. He's one of these men. He lays down. He goes right to sleep. I mean, really, very little shakes, John. And, and even before I get in bed, this man is asleep. And I'm just laying there terrified, just shaking and, and hearing the voice of the accuser saying, you know, I'm in charge of this guy. I'll bring him to your very door. I can bring him right here, and you can't stop me. And as I'm laying there in bed, shaking and hearing John snoring, I finally said to the Lord, this kind of fear is not from you. And suddenly, I mean, in a heartbeat, I was standing in our front yard looking at our house. Now, don't let me lose you here. My body was still in bed. But suddenly, I am standing in our front yard looking at our house. And right in the place where the two sidewalks come together, where you, there are entrances to our house, Standing in that very place where those sidewalks met stood the tallest man I had ever seen. He stood taller than our roof, and the brightness of the glory lit up the night. And he was standing at that place, and he had a sword drawn. And the Lord said to me, do you think anything can get through this? 
Next thing I knew, it was morning, and I was over it, over it completely. And I said to John, I did finally see our angel. I'm so glad I didn't open my eyes that night. I would have been terrified in our bedroom of this huge, tall, gloriously bright warrior. He is faithful. The, the, promise, the, the promise of his faithfulness, you know this scripture like I do in Romans 8 and 28. We know. We have this confidence that God is working all things together for good to them that love him, to them that are the called according to his purpose. Guess who that is? You, me, it's all of us. And we know with crisis comes opportunity. God is shaking us up, isn't he? He's stirring us up. And it is exciting, even in our areas of crisis, to see what God is doing. Faithfulness to his plan is important. During this time of COVID, when we were relegated to our homes for days on end, I, I was reminded that one of the reasons we get to live out this moment of faith is because generations before us were faithful. That's right. They laid the foundation of spiritual awakening. Missionaries crossed the world to evangelize with the gospel by the Holy Spirit, and we are the fruit of the seeds of faith that were sown in the land that day. You're the fruit. Isn't that exciting? You're their fruit. And then I get, when I get excited about that, then I remember there's a whole generation behind us watching us. What kind of seeds are we putting in the ground? Seeds of faith that will sprout and bring forth, hallelujah, fruit behind us. We must be faithful. During this time, I return to a passage that I love so much in the Old Testament. And uh, if you have your Bibles or Bible on your phone or whatever and you want to read along, I'm going to be reading from Isaiah chapter 6, uh, about the first eight verses. And let me give you just the background support of this passage. Uh, it comes from Second Chronicles. We won't go to Second Chronicles. But it, it concerns the reign of King Uzziah, who was a king in Judah. Who And they all have this little statement after their name. King Uzziah did right in the sight of God. He was a good king. But when the Lord blessed him, the Bible says that his heart rose up. And he usurped the authority of the priest by attempting to offer incense at the altar. And when the priest came in to try to stop him because he was doing something he was not supposed to do, he decided to use the incense as a tool and a weapon to pound on their heads. And when he raised his hand to come down against them, he was immediately hit with leprosy from the top of his hand to the bottom of his feet. And he would spend the rest of his life in a leper's house. Now, what that did to the people of Judah, whether it was fear or whether it was awe, you know, there's a, there's, awe is good fear, but there's also fear that's not good fear. They shut the temple up. N nobody went in, nobody came out. They just closed the doors, locked it up, and nobody went to the temple in all the years while King Uzziah until he died. In this crisis, there was no leadership. King was nowhere. There was no voice from God. The prophets didn't go to the temple to hear the voice of God and tell the people. And so in verse 1 of chapter 6, Isaiah identifies in the year that King Uzziah died. So we're, we're moving through this crisis. Now the crisis isn't over. Only the king is dead. But we find... Isaiah say, it was in the year that King Uzziah died. He returned to the temple. And I love this passage. I love how it reads. Even in the King James, I love how it reads. He said, I saw the Lord. Wow, wait a minute. Let's go back to Moses. Moses said, I want to see you. I want to see your glory. And God said, you can't see me. You can't see my glory and live. If you see me, you're going to die. And yet here's Isaiah some years later saying, I saw him. He was high and lifted up. 
Hallelujah. And let me, let me just remind you of what he says right after this. I saw the Lord, and guess what? He was still sitting on the throne. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He had not been knocked off the throne by our crisis. No, he wasn't behind the curtains. He was sitting on the throne. He was still in control. Hallelujah. He was still ordering the heavens and the earth. He was sitting on the throne, and he was high and lifted up. And his, his train, or his glory, filled the temple. It was full of the glory of God. There were seraphims, and I won't spend a lot of time there, but they cried one to another in verse 3, and there's this trilogy. It's like when you see him, all that can come out of your mouth is this word over and over and over again. He's holy. He's holy. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord. Hallelujah. Holy is the Lord of hosts and the whole earth, not just this temple. The whole earth is full of his glory. Woo, hallelujah. Think about it. The whole earth, this whole earth, this whole earth, your whole earth can be filled with the glory of the Lord of hosts. Hallelujah. And when we have nothing to say, it comes out of us anyway. Holy, holy, holy. And the post of the door moved at the voice of him and the house was filled with smoke. I'm so thankful that when God speaks, the doors of my life open up. Hallelujah. That nothing can shut when the when the voice of God has spoken, nothing can shut it up. Hallelujah. And I said to myself, woe is me, for I am undone. I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell among a people of unclean lips. Thank God he did an evaluation of himself before he accused everybody else. That's not a human tendency, is it? We like to find the fault of everybody else before we look back at ourselves. Yep, might as well say it's the truth. It is. My eyes have seen the king. The Lord of hosts, I have seen him. And then one of the seraphims flew to me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar. And he laid it on my mouth and he said, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity is taken away and your sin is purged. You know what they were doing for Isaiah? They were preparing him for what? next in the middle of the crisis crisis isn't over only the king is dead okay they were preparing Isaiah for the purpose of God sometimes we forget it we forget that there's a preparation we forget that we're people of unclean lips things pass through our lips before we even know it and sometimes we even say where did that come from yeah, we know where it comes from. That human nature rises up, doesn't it? And, and then it comes out, the influence of the enemy. But the, the seraphim said, you've been purged. Your mouth, your lips, your iniquity is taken away and your sin is purged. And immediately, verse 8 says, And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us. What a powerful invitation. What a powerful opportunity. Who shall we send and who will go for us? I see Isaiah like I see a six-year-old Charlie Brown that never has the right answer and suddenly he's got it. This is the one time in his life he's got the right answer. Ooh, 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 ooh. Here am I, send me, here am I, use me, hallelujah, as he returns to the dwelling place of God, he sees the Lord, the post, the doors, is moved at his voice, and the Lord says, whom shall I send, and who 
will go for us. Three, just three quick thoughts. The first thought is the prophet's availability. Even though the place known as the dwelling place of God had been shut up, one of the attributes of the prophet is that he makes himself available to God. In his efforts, we are given the privilege of experiencing the fresh encounter that the prophet is having with God. We get to experience it too. Hallelujah. Perhaps one of the lessons we've learned during the past two years is that of uncrowding our schedules and our routines is not as impossible as we would have believed. The world shut down. We went into isolation, quarantine. Perhaps given the privilege to schedule our own lives, we would overcommit ourselves to our own detriment. Perhaps the Lord has used this season to remind us of a godly order, a godly order of time, effort, ministry, and availability. My grandmother used to say about me, she said it all the time, that I would squeeze a nickel. Those were the days that there was an Indian, oh yes. She said she would squeeze that nickel until it would scream. I think what she was actually saying is, I crowd everything I can into my life. My answer is almost always yes. Almost always. People say, take some time to pray. I probably don't need time to pray. Yes. <laughs> we do that, don't we? And before we know it, every minute is taken. And when every minute is taken, when God opens an opportunity, we find ourselves too busy. When John and I were just married, our plans, we, we were, I was 19 years old. I was such a baby. He was a grown man. <laughs> and, but when we got married, our plans, we thought, well, we'll wait a while to have children. I need to grow up a little bit. We want to get stable a little bit. We want to have a home. We want to make sure that, you know, our feet are on the ground. Maybe we can do a little bit of fun things before we bring a baby. And so we had thought we'd wait two or three years to have a child. Imagine our surprise <laughs> when, when we'd been married about seven months I started waking up really sick in the mornings. His mother had died of cancer just before we were married, and so it was a bit of an alarm because we knew I couldn't be pregnant. We, we were taking care of that, you know. Went to the doctor, and uh, the doctor came in. He said, well, I've got good news and bad news. I said, okay. He said, the good news is you don't have cancer. I said, hallelujah. He said, the bad news for you, which is probably good news for everybody else, is you're going to have a baby. I started crazy. We can't have a baby. <laughs> oh, yes, you are. You are very much going to have a baby. <laughs> I'd said to the Lord, we were involved in ministry then. It was, you know, we were learning each other. And I said to the Lord, what is this about? And he took me to Isaiah 58 and verse 8 and 9. This is from the Living Bible. And he, he gave me this word. This plan of mine is not what you would work out. Neither are my thoughts the same as yours. In fact, as high as the heavens are higher than the earth, that's how much higher my ways are than yours and my thoughts than yours. I thought about that so many times when John and I had gone to pastor and, and we decided to have more children. And we, we got the good news three different times that we were going to have another child. And all three times we lost that baby. And I thought, how wonderful God is that he goes before us. He sees what's coming. He's our rear guard. He sees what's coming to try to catch us off guard. He surrounds us with his spirit and his plans are good. When my body was best able to carry a child, we had a child. God is faithful. His love stems from a plan that is infinitely superior yes. to ours. Yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God suggests to us the miraculous. He puts it in our heart. He puts it in our mind and our will. And he speaks the word of possibility and hope. And he looks for obedience and trust. Perhaps God is using this time to remind us 
We are vessels according to his plan and his purpose. Perhaps he's bringing an awareness that we had limited his availability to use us. Isaiah makes himself available. Here am I. Use me. The second thing I want to bring your attention to, there's, there's a dozen things in just these short eight verses. I brought it down to three. Somebody say, thank God. <laughs> Going to eat today, you know. The second thing I'll, I'll, and that speaks to me is the calling and the anointing of the prophet. When we witness this encounter, we know that Isaiah is already a serving prophet. He's already a prophet. He's already serving the people. However, in this moment, God speaks and gives him a fuller anointing and a very specific word. In this crisis, the prophet was called again for this purpose. Be who I've called you to be. Do what I've called you to do. And look, if you read some of those verses right after verse 8, you're going to see what God says to him. He says, it's not going to work. They're not going to listen to you. They're not going to change. What, I've, what I'm calling you to do isn't going to be fruitful. I'm calling you to do it anyway. Wow. Wow. The limitations will be high, but you'll be fulfilling my purpose, my plan. Sovereign God, I keep reminding myself of this over and over. Sovereign God has the capability of doing what he wills, even though what he wills surpasses the limits of human expectations. God's sovereignty means that he has the authority to move beyond the normal order and functions of expectations. And miraculous intervention is usually for the purpose of revelation. God is saying, I'm doing something important here. I don't want you to miss it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. There is a plan for us. There is a purpose for us. There was a purpose for Isaiah for many years. But he had not been moving in the full purpose. It's like God has rolled it over and said, I'm giving you another opportunity to get it right. Yes, amen. Wow. Some of us find ourselves, I'm one of those, that sometimes settle into a comfortable service to the Lord. I sit in the same seat. I do the same things at church. It's comfortable to me. I settle into the ordinary days of living and ministry. And sometimes we become ordinary when God has called us to be extraordinary. It's like the Lord has been speaking again to me. I'm 65 years old. Are you kidding me? And he says, dare to dream again, Kathy. Dare to dream again. Let me dream my dreams through you. (laughs) Hallelujah. When others have hit 65 and said, I'm done, I'm retiring. I'm just getting started with you. Get ready. (laughs) Get ready. Don't lean into maintenance. Don't lean into ordinary service. There's more. God wants to do the extraordinary through us. Don't settle for the inferior. God has the superior for you. He has the hot coals of fire to purify us, to burn in us. The Lord keeps saying to me, don't settle for anything. Keep looking for what I have. There's more in the joy of the Lord. I love the Psalm, 23rd Psalm. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow you all the days of your life and you will dwell on the house. Well, a friend of mine was, was, was doing an, um, just a word on this passage. And she said, I, sometimes I picture when I'm running around doing this and that, that goodness and mercy are right behind me, running right along with me, holding my robes in their arms, holding my crown and running right after me. She said, I don't ever stop quick because they bump right into me and knock me down. <laughs> I love that song that says, your goodness is running after It's running after me. There's much that God has planned for us. He's bringing us out of the ordinary. 
He's delivering us. Hallelujah. But he's not just delivering us to bless us. He's delivering us to bless us that we might be a blessing to others. Hallelujah. Our prayer must continue to be, Lord, use me. Hallelujah. Allow a word of life or influence to come through me that I might honor you and bring you glory. And even in these moments, there are some things that only God can do. We can prepare ourselves. We can study. We can learn. We can, we can work. But some things only God can do. Jesus said, with men, it's impossible. <laughs> but I love that word. But with God, all things are possible. When we get to the end, yeah, when we get to the end of what we can see, what we have the strength to do. When we get to the end of everything we know, get excited because you're just at the beginning of what God wants to do through us, what he wants to speak through us. Hallelujah. How he wants to use us. I use this word almost daily from Jeremiah 29, 11. You know it too. I know the plans God has for you. They're good plans. They're plans with the hope and they're plans with the future. A hope in this life and an eternity with him. Hallelujah. He's got great plans for us. The third word that I find in this passage, and I said there were only three, so here we go, is the prophet's obedience. Oh, man, I could have gone all day without talking about obedience, couldn't I? Oh, the obedience. Here am I. Send me. When we walk in obedience... God obliges by himself to bless us, to bless us. It's not always what it looks like, but God will bless us. I heard a man's testimony many years ago. It's getting close to that 12 o'clock, so I'm going to go into hyperdrive. Stay with me, okay? I heard this man testify about being in revival in his local church in Virginia Beach. We, we attended the church in Norview, and he... They were having a big old revival in Virginia Beach. And on, on one night, he called his wife from, from the office. He said, I'm just going straight to church. I'm not coming home. She said, that's okay. Just go on. She said, just on your way home, pick up some milk. We need some milk. And he pulled out his pocket. And I always write this down because I always forget how much it was in that day. He said, I had $2.34 in my pocket. And I said, I can get milk. And he went on to church. And he's sitting there. And they start to take up the offering. And the Lord speaks to him. And he says, I want you to put everything in your pocket in, in the plate. And when he hears that in his heart, he said, Lord, did you, did you forget? My, my wife is expecting milk tonight. I, I need to take home milk. And the Lord said, I want you to give everything you have in the offer, uh, offering tonight. And he said, Lord, have you forgotten? And the Lord said, every penny. And he said, do you remember my wife? <laughs> and suddenly the plate's in front of him. What are you going to do? He said, I pulled out every penny and I watched that offering plate go. <laughs> knowing that it held the peace in my home after church that night. <laughs> he said, after church, he didn't want to go home. Everybody had left. He just kept talking to the pastor. He kept talking and talking to the pastor. Time is passing. Finally, the pastor said, brother, we have time tomorrow to talk. It's getting late. Let's, let's go home. He just hung his head. Pastor locked the door. They're walking to their cars. And as he's walking to his car, a car pulls into, I don't know why God waits to the last minute. I don't. I don't. But he does. Car pulls into the driveway. And it was a family who had been at church earlier that night. They drove up to him and they said, oh, brother, we're so glad you are still here. The Lord spoke to us tonight before we ever left for church. And he told us to do something for you. And, and we, we left and we forgot to give it to you. This is from the Lord. And they handed him an envelope. He got so excited. He said, oh, thank you so much. Thank you so much. He didn't even open it then. He went to his car. He turned on the car. Pastor pulled out. He turned on the light. He opened the envelope looking for his $2.34. No, it wasn't $2.34. It was $234. To the penny, a hundredfold. To the penny, a hundredfold. That's when you wish you'd given $200. In extraordinary places, 
right in the middle of our processes, of our every day, God invites us into the supernatural, extraordinary presence of himself. And right there, using images that sometimes are not words, but just that our heart, he bypasses sometimes our head and goes right to our heart. He is waiting to speak to us, to breathe in us. And sometimes in God's plan, have you ever been on one of those roller coasters that all you could do was hold on? You couldn't even scream. All you could do is hold on. It's moving you all over the place. Sometimes in God's plan, all you can do is hold on. But be sure who you're holding on to. He's the one. He's the one. It would seem that our crises might linger for a while longer. I know like you do, we've lived through some difficult days. We buried Hank, Rhonda. We buried Marcus. I buried my sister. January. It touches us deeply. It's happening all over the world. It's globally. This is going on. And yet, this morning, God is still high and lifted up. And he's still on his throne. (laughs) Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And his glory still fills the earth. His voice moves the very post and doors of our lives. And the Lord is still seeking. Whom shall I send? And who is willing? No one is excluded from this invitation. No one. Each of us is positioned. I heard a minister say once, I saw the body of Christ and I was right here in his belly. I thought, well, that's a convenient place to be. Gets all the good stuff right there in the belly, right? Right. I don't know about that, but I know this. He positions us where we can be best used for his glory. Hallelujah. We are stationed at a strategic positioning at a strategic time on earth. We must make ourselves available to the Lord. We must remember that he has called us out of darkness, into his light. There is an anointing on our lives and he's looking for us to be obedient. I, I remember hearing this testimony many, many times as a child. Um, my grandmother had, I think it was three sets of twins. Only one set lived. Uh, but my mom was a twin. And um, when my mom was was in my mother's womb, in, in my grandmother's womb, she didn't know she was expecting a baby. And um, she, was, she was really sick, and the doctor came, and the fetus of my mom's twin had died and was deteriorating, decaying in the womb. So the doctor came to cover, I mean to clean out the infection and that kind of thing, but he never saw my mom. It's like, it's like God covered her with his hand. You, you can't tell me what God can't do. I know too much. And so several weeks later, my grandmother went into labor. And the doctor came and brought, brought my mom into this life, all one pound, two ounce of, of this baby. And when he brought her from the womb, he threw her in the box for the casket. Threw her there for her to be. He was mad that he hadn't seen her. Had to come back again. Deliver another lifeless form. And when he threw her on the bed there, my granddad said, well, this one's breathing. This one's alive. Doctor said, well, she won't live long. And every day he came by, his ha- by their little cabin on his way home to sign her death certificate. And every day she was still alive. (laughs) My grandfather said to her at some point, you showed that old doctor, didn't you? It was, it's winter. Kids are playing in the house and they live in a, they live on a mountain in a list, this little teeny tiny house. And, and so they had taken my mother and they had wrapped her in her sister's baby doll blanket and put her in her, her sister's baby doll crib and put her by the fire 
keep her warm. They fed her with the medicine dropper. Kids are in the house one day playing, and, and my aunt forgot that the baby was in the baby blanket and the baby doll's cradle, and she was playing with her baby doll, and she went to get the, the blanket. When she did, she whipped it up, and my mother took her first flight through air, <laughs> ended on the floor. My grandmother came in, you've killed my baby, you've killed my baby. My great-grandmother, who we don't have time to hear the stories of her faith, I wish we did, incredible woman of faith, one of the first to receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost, people who were sick, desperately sick, they wouldn't talk to her in the day, but at night they'd bring the sick people on the, on the flat boards, you know, for her to come out and pray for them. My great-grandmother came over to my grandmother's house, my granddad's house. He, she took my, gran my mom and said to my, my grandparents, go to bed, sleep. I've got the baby tonight. She stayed up all night long praying the miraculous in my mom, praying the grace of God in my mom, rocking her back and forth, speaking only the words that Holy Spirit can speak through you. The next morning when my grandmother got up, my great-grandmother handed my mother to my, great, to my grandmother. Are you with me? And this was the proclamation she made. This child will never be sick again. And she wasn't. How would she dare to go against the voice of the Lord? She grew and grew. She watched my granddad as he preached. One morning, she got up behind him. Everything he was doing, she was doing. He never made her sit down. She said, she said I can still remember the clapping of the heels on the wooden floor as the Holy Spirit would come through. Why didn't she die? She should have died because there was a plan. There was a purpose. If you are living and breathing today, <laughs> it doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter where you've been. It matters that you're living and breathing. There's a plan. There's a purpose. So then when I was born, breech baby, deformed in my face, legs twisted, brain damaged, they said. The doctor said to my grandmother, pray this child dies. She will never be worth anything. She will always be deformed in her face. She will never walk. There's extensive brain damage. My granny told me that doctor said they'd have to lock you away. My mother understood that God's plan is perfect, even when it's beyond the normal understanding. God's purpose for you is perfect. You may have tried to leave behind and forget what he spoke to you when you were a little child laying in your bed in the night watches, when he would sing his songs over you. You might have tried to leave that behind so it doesn't haunt you. No, no, it's not there for haunting. It's there to remember who you are. Woo! Who your father is. And that he has good plans for you, even if it takes the miraculous. Father, how precious it is that you are here in all of your glory still on the throne of the heavens, on the throne of our lives. Come, Holy Spirit, visit each of us. Remind us of the songs you sing over us at night. Remind us of the dreams you've given us to dream. Remind us of who we are and whose we are. Remind us that you're longing for our availability. Ooh. 